Our second reading comes from the Gospel according to John. Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. It is the night of his arrest before the day of his death. Hear what the Spirit may say. I've made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know everything that you have given me is from you, for the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them. And they know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I'm asking on their behalf. I'm asking not on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, except the one destined to be lost, so that the Scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world." I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world, so sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, so that they may also be sanctified in truth. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, so that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me, so that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as I have loved you. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. A pleasant murmur fills the gathering place on Sunday. Warm smiles, friendly conversation envelop you as you enter. People cluster with coffee in one hand, with a donut in the other, at tables with handcrafted cards, or with a sign-up sheet for church activities, or with easy laughter over here, and earnest plans over there, and empathic and compassionate looks and hushed tones off to another side. And now imagine the room has been filled that way for ages. Saints long preceding us talk with such spirit, it's hard for them to pause and to discern and to discuss and to explain with us exactly what they're talking about. In fact, the discourse began well before any of them. No one can retrace all the persons, all the voices that have been heard previously. You listened for a while. You get the gist. Then you hazard a word in your own voice. Someone answers, you reply. One person appreciates your perspective. Another offers alternate insights and infers a challenging question. And so conversation continues, interminably, eternally, fueled by Jesus-like miracles, maybe from our deacon baristas turning water into coffee multiplying donuts so there always seem to be 12 boxes full. And before you know it, time flies. Suddenly you realize it's getting late and you must depart. So you excuse yourself, warmly greeting others who've just arrived, leaving with the conversation still vigorous, still spirited, punctuated with laughter and maybe a few tears. As John tells the story, Jesus knew that his 
time to depart drew near. He longed for God's holy conversation with the world to continue, for the life in divine love that he embodied to remain vigorous and spirited after he left. The words you gave me, he prays to God, I gave to them. John calls him the word made flesh. And so, of course, when Jesus says they've kept God's word, he means far more than mere letters and phonics, even memorable quotes and ideas to follow. The disciples believe they give their hearts to the holy truth of love that he has embodied among them. And now Jesus prays that as they have received, so they will give with their lives, so they will speak this word of holy goodness that from the beginning is the presence and the power of God to give life and goodness and hope and joy, light in the darkness. In this way, truth and life, Jesus prays that we may be one and that our conversation may build abundant community in God's peace through the individuality of our voices as a loving unity of purpose arises. You see, friends, these words of Jesus and our own voice work in two ways, sort of symbiotically at the same time. Our language, the words we choose, shapes our reality, our relationships, our community life, for better or worse. And just as powerfully, our relationships, our community, the unity that Jesus desires for us in living faith is itself a language, a word made flesh, an expression of God's gospel of love, a message for others to hear. Few delights in life surpass the pleasure of good conversation. I love it when we tell stories and laugh. I'm grateful when we struggle together over questions and through tears, more than just a job for me or a Sunday activity for all of you, good conversation, friends, is our life, our holy vocation. Whatever we actually say and do each day, wherever we work or volunteer, however we pass the time, God calls us to spread good news of steadfast love as the greatest meaning and purpose of our relationships and the truest expression of living faith. St. Francis of Assisi urged, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. So words of the Bible, prophets like Isaiah and Esther, apostles, like Mary and Paul and Philip, even our rituals of worship and the practices of our service all speak God's word made flesh. So friends, how do we hear this language spoken from the past? How do we make sense of it amid all of our own present experiences? How do we speak to pass along the good news for generations to come? We face many challenges of language in our contemporary culture. Some of us lament the detriments of texting and Twittering and Facebooking on spelling and grammar. I've been amusingly chagrined, I confess, at my own hasty messages that have been twisted by autocorrect. (laughs) And I wonder, how such practices may accelerate the natural evolution of language that's always happening. Still, maybe these words shared in this way are like getting into a chariot with someone else, like Philip and the Ethiopian, like Suzanne and I this weekend when she's at a soccer tournament up in Traverse City. A more persistent and relevant question is whether we limit relationship to these superficial exchanges or do they open possibilities for more constant and deeper connections? As we seek the deeper expressions of faith, friends, we also face simple challenges of expressing our experiences of God. Biblical writers tried to capture the eternal in very temporal, finite 
words. Ambiguities and inaccuracies affect the translation from one language to another. Philip and and, and the Ethiopian eunuch, for example, they come from very different cultures and very different native languages. Luke doesn't tell us this, but when they sat in the chariot, I wonder how much they actually understood each other's actual words. Or maybe in and through and despite the linguistic challenges, the Ethiopian heard good news of God's love in Philip's very presence. And maybe like all of us, whether baptized as an infant or an adult, before we really know it, we connect water with a longing and a promise of God's love, full understanding of which we live into for the rest of our days. Then there's variant understandings in the very common words of our faith that can be literally and hostily defended that then festers the disunity that plagues Christianity and turns people from Christ. As I began seminary, I struggled with big words like Trinity and Christology and salvation and sanctification and atonement. Explanations that I heard about that sheep led to the slaughter on the cross and the implications for our life didn't really make me feel very loved or inspired to love. Must I chuck the Christian words in the faith, I asked, or choose something else? Or can I reclaim the language in some way and give it new life? Imagine the relief, the joy, the hope, the inspiration when I learn that in our faith history, there abides a rich multiplicity of meanings. More than one definition or one doctrinal explanation, it's more like an ongoing conversation across generations about what these words tell us of God in our time and our cultural context. For instance, relative to this Easter season, we can all believe in the resurrection of the body and we can share different understandings with that next seeker in the chariot rolling by. I won't soon forget a lunch conversation with my liaison, God bless her, who was assigned to set me straight on these big words as I prepared for ministry. As I shared my epiphany about the resurrection that day, I fear I troubled her even more. Still, I trust that unity in embodying God's word of love does not require absolute uniformity in the use and the meaning of our words. Amid the sheer volume of words we we process every day on our computers, our radios, our TVs, always in the background, increasing exponentially, amid the language of society, sometimes entwined with faith, that can seem like George Orwell's double speak. Maybe not unlike, in essence, if not yet the evil extent of Joseph Goebbels' infamous Nazi practice of telling people a lie often enough they come to trust it true. Amid sobering statistics on illiteracy, like 26 million adults, half the unemployed population who can't read a bus schedule, a newspaper, or map directions, or even a paycheck, while average kindergartners have seen over 5,000 hours of television in their life, more than it takes to earn a bachelor's degree. How can we, like Philip, listen for divine guidance, open our hearts to neighbors and strangers, whoever among us may be seekers of God? How do we know what to say in those difficult moments of socially sensitive situations? How do we find the right words in more intimate relations, like when we find a friend has cancer? From our everyday chatter with family and friends to the deep questions of faith, the the church committee meetings, the, the supper clubs with which we meet, 
to our greatest hopes for our political discourse in this city, in our country, throughout the world. How can we spread the good news of Jesus Christ? God's word of love for the world that all people may be one in grace and peace and abundant life. It began when Philip got in and sat with the Ethiopian eunuch. He talked about words of Scripture. He expanded the scope and the embrace of God's love to another person who, despite wealthy superficiality, is really an outcast. He created community beyond another boundary in the commonwealth of God. In that spirit, who do you meet? Each day in the great gathering place of life, someone who longs to know in the prophetic promise if God's love might even be true for him or her too. Caring for one another is not entirely separable from caring for words, writes Marilyn Chandler McIntyre. Words are entrusted to us as equipment for our life together to help us survive, to guide, to nourish one another. She seeks to foster good conversation that is really community cultivated for the common good. Speaking of words, McIntyre infers about people what just could seem to me like an extension of Jesus' prayer and Philip's conversation. Love words, she advises. Find words in each individual that satisfy a hunger for something deep inside beyond conveying basics of necessary information. Use words thankfully, recognizing each as a gift, a legacy from the one who was in the beginning with God, who was God. Tell the truth, she insists, and don't tolerate lies. And that means everything from resisting hyperbole in marketing and politics and parenting to precision that enables us to observe and to represent differing viewpoints fairly. Our goal is to be wise as serpents about uses and abuses of language and harmless as doves as we seek peace by focusing lovingly on community rather than obsessing about the corruptions we see in common life. Finally, share stories and pray and play with words, McIntyre urges, as we simply stay in conversation. Conversation is not simple, and good conversation, she says, is rare. Still, it is the source for the very foundational documents and for the ongoing operation of our society. Good conversation is a demanding vocation that involves skilled listening, self-awareness, spiritual discipline, all as a form of social action. At its best, good conversation conveys an exchange of gifts through curiosity and generosity and honesty, and dignity for all. It is a form of caring that has as its deepest implicit intention the binding of one another together in understanding and love. Imagine, friends, how the conversation of living faith has continued in this sanctuary in the city. That's how I see Every sermon, every hymn or anthem we sing, every prayer we share together, when we arrive, the air is filled with others who have long preceded us, engaged in spirited discussion. It's as if these very stones could speak. These windows echo the welcoming murmur of God's love that envelops us as we enter. Others smile to welcome us, too, and though no one pauses to explain in detail the thread of every word that has gone before, we listen for a while, then we hazard our own voice 
Someone answers, some agree, others offer alternative perspectives. Inevitably, we know it's getting later for some of us in this place. Yet here's the good news. In divine beauty and joy and hope and goodness this day, we greet others named Ansley and Elliot and Harley. They will surely try to join the conversation. I'm not sure if I am looking forward to whether they're coos or cries as we all share this sacramental moment, may you remember how God has claimed you, or may you hear anew, like the Ethiopian in a chariot, how God may be speaking and you can learn to speak. For so the conversation continues, friends, interminably, eternally, in the glory of our unity in Christ, that others may come to believe. Thanks be to God. Amen.